Hello there, welcome to Quackalope, thank you for being here. Today I'm talking to you about the six board games we played after a two, two and a half month hiatus after having our newborn son. The first month was just a complete wash, except for one quick game that my wife played within the first week of having the baby as a way to just mentally disconnect, or the games of Sprawlopolis that we lost horrifically while she was in labor, or the game of Age of Steam that we finished on Shabbat after her water broke. There were some board games mixed in there, don't, don't get me wrong, like we're still a board game family, but a newborn adds a level of chaos that, well, I think we were expecting, but doesn't mesh well with the level of chaos I already tend to bring to the table. The crying and sleeping and recovering and trying to figure out how to do tummy time and move and walk and start gooing and guying and all of those other wonderful, magical, incredible things. And yet at the same time, we like board games. We run a board game channel. It doesn't do very well for us to not play any board games over the course of one month, two months. We were moving into three months. So we visited a friend and we went out of our way to prioritize getting games to the table. It took a little bit of min-maxing, took a little bit of finagling, had to figure out exactly what the rhythm of our son was. We definitely played some games, trading off uh, with one person holding him while the other person was taking their turns. We had some screaming matches where I screamed at the baby, the baby screamed at me, I stuck a pacifier in his mouth, he stuck a pacifier in my mouth. It was a lot of back and forth, a lot of talking, a lot of shifting. A lot of strong strategic negotiation. What I'm saying is my son is going to be excellent at those type of games. We're talking Chinatown, we're talking, uh, Ch yeah, Chinatown, we're talking Bear Raid. We've already got strong negotiation skills, except this time, Shira and I conquered. We played six massive games. I'm going to tell you about the games that we played, why we chose to play those games, and I'm going to rank all of them on a scale of, well, them compared to them, the other games we played, if I like them or not, I'll tell you which one's the worst and which one's the best, and how effective or reasonable it is to play said game after having a baby. You've got to keep that in mind, right? If you're going to, if you're going to approach this puzzle, approach it strategically. Go in with guns loaded. Let's, let's start the conversation. Let's start talking about the board games we actually were able to play. And I'm gonna start with actually my least favorite scanning real quick, just making sure. Yeah, I, I actually think surprisingly enough, my least favorite out of the six is a game that we have been hyped on in the past and is a game we have done tons of coverage of before, even coming from a genre and a format and an IP that we love, Marvel Zombies. Hold on, I know, I understand. We've hyped up Marvel Zombies way too much for me to be sitting here telling you that it was the least favorite of the six games we played after coming back, but I have a very compelling reason that it was my least favorite. We only had the base game. We had no Kickstarter extras. We had no expansions. We had no extra missions, no extra cards, no extra enemies. And so we played through like two or three of the six or seven main game core box buy it retail style adventures and they felt very samey and the monsters were very similar and the enemies we had and the heroes we could play there was not enough variance which is always a massive complaint around simon games they give you everything in the kickstarter and then they piecemeal out give you little bits and items and tokens in retail and you can never get all the kickstarter stuff and this is a good example of that. Like, I am glad I still own Marvel Zombies. I'm excited to continue diving into it, but only with the giant context that I have everything. So this was fine. This was what we expected it to be, but it definitely overstayed its welcome by the end of the third game, which is kind of remarkable because you want a board game to stick around a little bit longer. The next on my not as favorite list moving in is going to be a lovely copy of Ark Nova. Now this is the game that Shira played within the first week, the first, yeah, the first week after giving birth uh, because she just needed her brain to disconnect. So I sat there with the baby, gave him a bottle, dad hung out, and Shira got a chance to sit down and play a board game. This is hit or miss for her and for me as well though, a little bit too random, a little bit too luck of the draw, a little bit too driven by the scoring conditions that are available there on the table. Now, for those of you that don't know, Marvel Zombies is a zombicide game you're playing as Marvel superheroes cooperatively working together, 
trying to defend the city and accomplish the mission against the hordes of other, well, zombified superheroes coming to bite your face off. Argnova, you're running a research project, a, a zoo, a, uh, a habitarium. You're trying your best to maximize profit while also being ecologically friendly. When those two score trackers cross, you're going to trigger the end of the game, and whoever has the biggest difference between the two of those after they've crossed the point threshold will be the victor. So you really want to drive up both scores as aggressively as possible. I don't find that I like this very much. Base game, I, just to be clear, I actually do like the expansion that they added in. I think it adds a little bit more. I like the new, uh, what, the new resources or partnerships that you can acquire. So the aquatic expansion that they've mixed in did enhance Arc Nova for me. But base game Arc Nova, I don't know. I, I, we probably have played it a total of going on maybe 15 to 20 times at this point, and it just hasn't continued getting better for me. It's always fun. It's always fine. It's always like a solid 6, 6.5 out of 10 for me. But it's just not, it's just not singing songs. Moving on over to a game that is oft compared to Arc Nova that is substantially better. So if all of you thought that my taste didn't align with yours when, when it came to this game, let's see if I can redeem myself with some lovely terraforming Mars, the game we played the most post baby and this was and is and still remains to be one of the best games ever i know i've come out in the past talking about how the artwork's ugly it's grown on me how it needs more flavor text and the board should be redesigned i'm kind of nostalgic for them now i just i like terraforming mars i like it a ton so does shira so does our friend who we introduced it to for the first time it might in fact be his favorite game of all time now which for, for a time being, Arc Nova was competing for that obsessive uh, location, that obsessive standpoint. It's just, it's just really, really good. And played very well with the baby. Surprisingly enough, played very well with the baby. We'll talk about that in just a moment, though. Let's continue going through the six games that we played post-baby. Age of Steam. I don't know if this counts as actually playing it. Hear me out. We got it at the table. We got it set up. We taught a full game, and then our friend decided that he hated it. I mean, just cannot do route building games. We got about halfway through, and we decided to allow him to nope out in favor of going and playing something like Terraforming Mars that we all were currently having a good time with. So, Age of Steam is in Shira's top three, I believe. It's, I mean, it, I think it's Terraforming Mars, Age of Steam, and Kingdom Death, and they kind of rotate where they position depending on what she's been able to invest her attention on. Kingdom Death might hold that number one spot permanently. I mean, for me, it's the number zero spot. It's got way too much nostalgia to ever move out of that position. And Age of Steam is in my top five, I would imagine. I haven't done a top ten list in a long time, so let me know if that's something that I should be working on and ruminating on, because I think I think my top ten list has actually changed drastically since I last did it in 2020 or 2021. I don't know. I always wanted, I didn't want to do another top 10 list until things had shifted. And I think things have shifted now. Three, four more years of board game experience, new games that we've given into uh, that we never have in the past. Either way, Age of Steam is also the game that we finished playing a full game of with our friends on Shabbat after Shira had started moving towards uh, labor, after her water broke. So, I think it counts as one of the board games we've played during this last season of life, and it is lovely. It's a route-building, delivery-based game with a beautiful economic system and so much variance between the maps. So if you like a little bit of economy, if you like a little bit of uh, tile placement, take that, connect pieces to other pieces, and scurry little colored cubes across a map so they deliver you as much points as possible. This is just a remarkable, beautiful, wonderful game. And they even have their own convention called Age of Steam Con. You don't see Terraforming Mars having their own convention. You don't hear of Terraforming Mars Con. So, worth noting. Brass Birmingham. I know, it seems like we played a lot of heavy Euro games. And, and that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's true. Like, our approach was, was to play a lot of the top 10, the BGG top 100 uh, that's what we're currently working on right now. We're currently trying to play through with our friend, with myself, Shira, and our friend. We're trying to play through all of the BGG Top 100 so we can all have more knowledge and get a better grasp underneath ourselves for projects that we have coming down the road. Brass Birmingham worked for Shira 
excellently. She loves this game. After she played it the first time, she ended up getting full copy with the iron chips, iron clays, whatever it is. I'm mixed on it, but I had a very interesting insight around Brass Birmingham. The cards that you're playing with, this is a route-esque building game with a very interesting time shift in the middle where you transition from one economic phase of ferries to another economic phase of railroads, and that makes the long-term planning and the way that you build your engine to get as much reward and get as much, uh, utilize the, the cards and resources you have to the greatest extent you're able is very slick. It's very slick, it's very tricky, and rewards multiple plays. We played this twice. We played the intro, which ends after the fairy phase, and then we played a full game of it. Our friend didn't like it. He doesn't like route building, doesn't work for him. Shira absolutely loves this game. For me, because I have dyslexia, I found that because the cards only have names and then an abstract picture instead of a beautiful piece of art or illustration, uh, the game th thematically is very is, is very lovely. But if I'm sitting at an angle to the board where I can't read the names on the board very easily, I struggle a lot. And so for the second game, I actually positioned myself so that I could read the board flat on and see all the names. I, it was probably the most competitive game and the most enjoyable game of Brass Birmingham that I have had yet. So an interesting insight into how I interact with and play board games and what I need to facilitate a fun gaming environment and something that I'm gonna be paying attention to because I might in the future have to position myself in a way that allows me to see, read, and consume text so that I don't check out of the game for the sake of never being able to remember what card I have, where it's tied to on the map, and you know, recall all the positions of all seven, eight, nine cards that I have in my hand throughout the course of the game without being able to visually identify and see it. And the last game that we played, number six of six, probably the best game of them all, I would imagine. There's a little note in the back of this. I'm very curious about that. Uh, interesting. I don't know. Splatter Team wrote a note in here. Duck Dealer. We did not play Duck Dealer. This is a stand-in. I actually don't own a copy of this game. And now I'm immediately uh, blanking on what the game is. This is really, this is, this is a horrible thing to do. I have the game in mind. Approaching this video. I pulled this box because it is a sci-fi based game. It is a tech tree based game. It's a game all about building out your sci-fi engine, uh, your, your, your technology engine in red, green, blue, and yellow, and moving up this map unlocking different cards, doing very interesting worker placement, playing with dice that are not dice, but instead resource trackers and tokens. What is it called? What is it called? I can even see the front cover of the box has this big, bold, white text. We played with the expansion, which added in leaders and heroes. You have these missions that you fight over in the galaxy, over to the side. Leave a comment down below if you can save the day and answer the question of what game did we actually play I'll just go ahead and talk about it from, from that abstract sense. It, it is amazing. It's a game that we have to get added to our collection. We haven't added it to our collection yet for sake of just not having the resources to acquire it and having friends that own it already, so we don't need to get it immediately. But I really liked the expansion for this unnamed game that people will leave in the comments down below, and I'll have to pin to the top of the video. I'm going to remember the name of this. The moment this stops recording, you know, and I'm going to come back, I'm going to come back, I'm going to scream the name. Oh, what is it? It's not Cosmic Empire. It's not Galactic Empire. It's not Cosmic Explorer. It's not, oh man, it's not Galactic Cruise. I cannot believe. Cosmic something, maybe? I, I can't believe I'm completely blank. That's the that's the dyslexia working against me there. Uh, my ability to recall names limited. My ability to recall pictures, stories, and uh, tell tales is heightened because the way that words process in my brain, unlike your brain, is you use, you, you probably use the more if you, if you have a um, non-dyslexic brain. Uh, that means the part of the brain that deals with uh, numbers, memory, um, short-term and long-term recall, uh, deals with kind of analytics. Uh, that part of the brain is the part of the brain that learned language for you. There's not one subsection of the brain that specifically is, is assigned to the task of learning language. And so if you have a part of your brain that's underactive or, or, or not as active as it, as it might be, like apparently I did when I was young, then 
for me, the part of the brain, and oftentimes for dyslexic individuals, the part of the brain that handles visual cues, not memorization, not analytics, not rote, uh, you know, storytelling. The part of the brain that handles visuals is the part of the brain that learned language for me, which means I cannot spell at all. It affects your uh, short-term kind of immediate recall, but I can tell stories and I can see pictures and I can remember nicknames and all of that's kind of its own unique, uh, wonderful superpower. I'm, I'm just buying time to hope that my brain catches up but because I, I still need to talk and I still need to engage with you all the audience, I'm unable to do that. Let's go ahead and rank these very quick and let you know which ones were the best, worst to play with kids. Terraforming Mars, best game overall, and I think one of the better games to actually play with a newborn because you're all kind of focused on your own task. You can set the cards down for a time period if you need to go change a diaper without having too much happen on the board or having your uh, memory or needing your memory to be jogged significantly. And because everything in terms of your strategy is in the hand of cards that you have, you kind of can look at your hand and figure out exactly what you were doing anyway. Along with that, Terraforming Mars is one of those games that kind of has some natural breakpoints, which was very valuable to playing to playing with a newborn because we weren't pausing in the middle of a larger session or a larger story. Instead, finish a sequel, you know, finish a season, finish a cycle, uh, get ready to redraft cards and pause there and come back to the table in 20, 30 minutes after you've dealt with the kid. Terraforming Mars, best game out of these six and... Uh, arguably, um, the best with a newborn. Although, you know, there might be some others that are that are good, uh, good arguments. Age of Steam is not going to be high on this list right now because we didn't actually finish a full game um, with our friend because he decided he didn't like it. I'm going to bring out this one. This will be the second one, not Duck Dealer. Remember, the science-based game, the sci-fi-based game that I described accurately enough that people have left comments down below telling me what it is, I'm so furious about this. This was this was the second best game. Maybe not the best for playing with a kid, though, because the tech trees and the programming and the order of placing your workers down and whose turn it was and wasn't, all of that requires a little bit more dedicated focus. So this needs to be played during a sleep cycle or while you're holding the baby. You don't want a lot of distraction. I think we lost, I think I lost, I think Shira lost at least one of these sessions by playing whatever this game is, comments, uh, by, by playing this game without uh, being able to focus entirely because we had the baby in our hands. Third best game out of this bunch, I'm going to go with Brass. Maybe not the best game experience, but Brass worked really well. Very much enjoyed it uh, after I figured out the, you know, angle myself appropriately for the game. I don't know that this is one of my favorites. It is one of Shira's favorites, so I know we will be playing it more. I think I need to get a little bit better and a little bit more... Uh, uh, informed on the strategy and the way that the game shifts. It also has a natural breakpoint in the center, although I don't think it lends itself very well to playing with uh, a kid. None of these games are the best for playing with a kid. Um, yeah, that was probably obvious when I pulled Terraforming Mars out. I mean, Brass has a natural middle point, but it's such a heavy, such a strategic, such a don't miss this thing or else you will uh, lose the game um, type of project. Age of Steam. Absolutely lovely, absolutely wonderful. Does play solo, does play two player, does play three player, four player, on and on and on and on. Wonderful game, I think, even to play with a baby. It's not so complex that you can't have natural pauses and you can't dive in. I think this is probably the second strongest game to play with a baby. Arc Nova is going to be fifth. It is not a game that is sticking with me. Uh, I just don't love the base game. I, again, I like the expansion, but not enough to like pull me back to it all the time. Happy to play it, happy to dive into it, but I'd rather play Terraforming Mars. And I think we're all agreed on that at this point. If you want something a little bit different from Terraforming Mars, Arc Nova provides a compelling uh, entry point into that conversation. I should really do a play this not bad or why Terraforming Mars is better than Arc Nova, why Arc Nova is better than Terraforming Mars. That would be an interesting video. As far as accessibility towards baby, I would say it's on the lower scale. You got too much stuff going on on the board. And if you miss your window for activating or taking advantage of something that's going to give you those extra points necessary to win the game or close the game, could be a big shift. Could be a big change. Marvel Zombies, probably one of the better ones. A cooperative game. We uh, People could walk away while we continued playing the game. So when it comes to like kid accessibility, maybe this is better than Terraforming Mars. But you have to want to play the game. 
in order for it to take the cake. And so in that case, it's not. I mean, any cooperative game is going to be slightly at an advantage compared to a competitive game like any of the other ones we listed. But here's the thing. Base game Marvel Zombies, not worth your money. Not worth investing in. Not worth diving into. If you're going to be going down the road of Marvel Zombies or any of the Zombicide games, I highly recommend looking into and getting some of the expansions because they just add more variants, more variability, more opportunities to play as cool heroes and have unique enemies pop up out on the board. And the third or fourth time you're fighting a second Doctor Strange, it's just not there. It's just not, it's just not for us, but very, 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 very playable because as soon as one player is uh, tired of the game or annoyed with whatever's happening, they could walk away with a baby and the other people could just go ahead and wrap it up and finish it on their own. So gives you some natural break points where you'd rather go change a dirty diaper than sit and play uh, this game. Now, again, I'm not talking about the bigger Kickstarter version of it. I need to dive into it a little bit more. I'll be honest about that. But base game, base game we had our fill of after about three total sessions. So I'm going to do the little, uh, let's see, we might use this as a thumbnail. Marvel Zombies down, you know, I could do, uh, let's see here, Terraforming Mars, do a thumbs, we'll do a thumbs, thumbs up, thumbs down, a little bit of a grimace face, I don't know, we'll see, I don't know if this is, I'm going to do a live stream after I finish this, that's what I've been doing recently, and talk to the people and, and, and let them see the thumbnail, they'll help, the audience, like four of them, will help me decide which thumbnail I use, so that if you guys hate it, I I can blame them. I can say it was their it was their fault. It was the audience's fault. So that's good. Whatever the case, though, whatever you do, remember to do the important thing. Always find a scapegoat. My wife gave birth to ours. You should figure out yours. Specifically, a, a goat. You know, the term scapegoat actually comes from uh, the the biblical text, where you'd have a, a goat that would take the sins of of the nation and be sacrificed, and then you have a goat that would be um, brought out. And, and thrust into the desert uh, as a way to like lead demons off into uh, you know into the wilderness. Very interesting. It was a goat that was uh, that was drawing them away from you. It was it was it was sacrificing itself on behalf of you. Okay, I, I mean that's a bit. I don't know why you're still. Oh, I know why you're still here, because you're gonna leave a comment down below. You're gonna say, hey, quack, thanks so much for doing videos. I would love to see X video. I would love to leave that comment. Let me know. And then you're going to hit the, the, what is it? The subscribe button, the like button. You're going to do the do. You're going to do the stuff. You watch, you watch to this point. So engage with the video. Help us do better. We like doing better. That's, it's a whole, it's a, like a YouTube thing. I don't know why people on YouTube like doing better, but they do. So hit the doobly do, leave the dobbly da, and remember, I don't know what you should remember. I still can't think of that that darn game. I know I'm going to think of it the moment I turn this off. Oh, man. Oh, man. We'll see you next time. Bye.